let us hear from the from God. Open your manuscripts from the page of forty two, line six to forty three, line sixteen. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout person, and also in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Also some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers debated with him. Some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign divinities. This was because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So they took him and brought to the, him to the Aragopas and asked him, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting? It sounds rather strange to us, so we would like to know what it means. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners living there would spend their time in nothing but telling or hearing something new. Then Paul stood in front of the Aragopas and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as an unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor, he made all nations to inhabit the whole land. And he allotted the times of the existence and the boundaries of the places where they will live so that they will search for God. And perhaps look for him and find him. Though indeed, he's not far from each one of us. For in him, we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his own offsprings. Since we are God's offsprings, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and the imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Amen. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some scoffed and said, but others said, well, we'll hear you again about this. At that point, Paul left them, but others joined him and became believers, including Dionysius, the Aragopite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. God bless you. Thank you, Rebecca. Amazing. Kenyatta University is a good university. It's only second to more university. Today we are looking at relevant contextualization. His power, his witnesses, transforming the world through relevant contextualization. Yesterday when we saw the stoning of Stephen to death, there was a young man who was watching as Stephen was being martyred. And those who were stoning Stephen and had removed the outer cloaks, put them at the feet of this young man called Saul. Of course, we have skipped a few passages and now we enter Acts chapter 17 on page 42 of your manuscript. Manuscript starting in line 6, and we come across this character called Paul. Paul is that young man who was watching as Stephen was being martyred. He met Jesus on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. He was converted, and he became a preacher of the gospel of Christ. Of course, first of all, when he was converted, no one was willing to go near him because they thought he was just pretending so that he can catch them and have them in prison. But thank God for people with the gifts of encouragement. Barnabas, who was called, who had this gift, looked for Paul and brought him, trained him, and nurtured him. 
and even brought him to Antioch, where Barnabas had been sent and as apostle. And through, as they ministered, Barnabas and Paul served God. And the church in Antioch, after a time of prayer, decided to send out the first mission team. And whom did they choose? But the very best, their very own leaders. They prayed for them after prayer and fasting and just anointing them and commissioning them. They sent them off on this missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas. And of course, Mark was also with them. But as things got difficult, Mark deserted them and uh, Paul and Barnabas continued on their journey. But when they were to set off for their next missionary journey, uh, Paul and Barnabas disagreed quite sharply because Barnabas, the servant of God with encouraging gifts or gifts of encouragement, wanted to take Mark with them. But Paul, who had a slightly more uh, maybe task-oriented approach, decided that Mark is not reliable. He, he has a habit of quitting when things get difficult. And, and so they parted ways and Paul went off with Silas. And Barnabas went to Cyprus with Mark, and we don't hear about uh, Barnabas again. But when they started off, the Bible record in Acts, Barnabas and Paul. But as the ministry continued, and Paul was perhaps the most eloquent speaker, we find that things switched. It became Paul and Barnabas. And later, Paul and Silas went off to this missionary journey that, found them into, that led them into the Philippian jail uh, once. And there they led the Philippian jailer to Christ. And it was so urgent that they had to baptize those who got saved that very hour of the night. That's how things were moving quickly. And so it brings us through a lot of times when Paul, as he preached, there are times he was thrown out of cities. He went to Thessalonica and things were, were, were difficult. And then they went to Berea where the believers were a bit more accommodating. They were keen to hear what Paul was saying. But they searched the scriptures to find out whether what, what Paul was saying was really true in Acts chapter 17. But then the people who had thrown Paul out of Thessalonica, some uh, Jewish uh, uh, people, they followed uh, them into Berea and Paul was forced to go on into Athens. And that's where we find the story in Acts chapter 17. It is important to remind ourselves that the book of Acts was authored by Luke, who was a physician and the only Gentile author of the New Testament. He was a travel companion of Paul, which gave him first-hand exposure to Paul's missionary journeys. In Acts, we see how the gospel transforms people to the extent they are, that they are willing to move beyond their social, cultural, and ethnic boundaries to ensure that God's kingdom is established among all ethnicities of the world. This was also God's plan from the beginning, that all nations will be blessed through the witness of his people, starting with the promise he made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 and was carried through to the nation of Israel and later on to the church in the New Testament. At Pentecost, this was again affirmed as people from all over the known world were gathered in Jerusalem and witnessed the birth of the church. Paul arrives in Athens at the back of his ministry in Thessalonica and Berea, where he faced opposition from jealous Jews who stirred up the crowds to cause disorder in the city to drive Paul and his ministry team away. His arri arrival in Athens was to enable him to wait for Silas and Timothy, who had been left in Berea, to join him. However, as he waited for them, Paul was distressed by the extensive worship of pagan idols in the city. Apart from being dominated by pagan culture, one observes two further traits of this city. It had Epicureans, Epicureans who were avowed materialists, whose philosophy was basically about the pursuit of pleasure, and especially the pleasure of the mind. Although they did not deny the existence of gods, they claimed that gods had no influence on the human experience. This meant that all one owned and experienced in life is down to human effort, and so people need to live for the moment. That was the Epicureans. They saw the highest pleasure being the ability to be free from the unnecessary fear of death and the gods 
and the anxiety that arose from such thinking. Athens also had Stoics. These were rationalists who believed that God lies within the soul itself, which can overcome anxieties of ordinary life through wisdom and restraint. According to them, the world came about by fate, so human beings could achieve harmony with nature and themselves by endurance and self-sufficiency. According to the IVP, New Testament commentary series, the prevailing philosophies of the West's post-Christian era today, which is secular humanism and New Age panthe pantheistic type of postmodernism, are remarkably like the Epicurean and the Stoic philosophers that Paul found in Athens. So let's come to the passage, uh, having given you that brief and quick introduction or background to our passage. The first thing that we note as we enter into this passage on page 42 of your manuscripts and line 6, we find that the scripture says that while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and also in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. So what's the first thing that we learn from this passage? Paul is distressed by idolatry. Paul distressed by idolatry. We observe in line 6 and 7 that Athens was a city full of idols. J.C. Ryle offers the following commentary about this verse. The temples of idol gods and goddesses occupied every prominent position. The magnificent statue of Minerva, at least 40 feet high, according to Pliny, towered above the Acropolis and caught the eye from every point. A vast system of idol worship overspread the whole place and thrust itself everywhere on his notice. We are told in line 7 of page 42 that Paul reasoned with the Jews and God-fearing Greeks in both the synagogue and the marketplace day by day with those who happen to be there. According to the IBP New Testament commentary series, the Athenian marketplace, also known as the Agora, was the place of public and business life of the city where people gathered to discuss the latest ideas and news. In our modern context, the marketplace is equivalent to a market in any part of Africa, a city or town square, a shopping mall, a cafeteria, Java, Nyamachoma joint for Kenyans, the gym, newspaper stands, all those kind of places would be similar to the Agora, the marketplace of their time, where people met to discuss the latest news and the latest ideas floating around. I'm, I'm sure that in your universities, maybe it is the student center where people gather or those Kamukunji grounds, as sometimes they used to be called. Paul was ready to go where their people are so that he may take the gospel to them. He did not wait for them to come to him. He was ready to go. The question I want to pose to you today, are you distressed by the modern idols we see around us? Our current society is full of many idols. Materialism is one of them, driven by greed. Then there are the shopping malls. Those are idols. We may be thinking it's a sign of advancement and there is a good side to it. But the whole idea behind it is encouraging you to go into one place you can see a lot of things and buy as much as you can. And if possible, take some of them on loan. The other modern thing that is capturing so many across this continent and especially in Kenya today is gambling. It is unbelievable how people can be deceived 
that that is how God provides. <laughs> Gambling has become big business if you are a Christian and a believer in Jesus Christ. We are not called to gamble our lives. God remains our provider. The Bible teaches about working hard. It may take time. But once you have worked hard and gained your wealth through work hard, working hard, you'll be grateful. Gambling is not a biblical principle. And we must shy away from it and we must challenge it. If you already have been drawn into that as a possibility for God meeting your needs, may the Lord help you. I was in Zambia and I met a sister who was sharing with me how they came from a very poor background. And her mom finished a field one of these, uh, you know, sweepstake things and she won a house. And I was very sympathetic because I could understand her plight. But let me encourage you that that is not what God has called us to do. We should be distressed about these modern idols. Other idols we find today is celebrity culture. You know, today we are surrounded by a celebrity culture that fills that, uh, fills our media, film, and sports arenas of life. Now, they, we need to understand that there are good things in all these things. But we need to be careful that they do not enslave us. And celebrity culture, of course, has even entered the church. But God needs to help us to be distressed about the spirit and the motive behind this kind of culture. And that is what Paul sees as he enters into Athens. Today we are driven by fashion and secularist ideas that remove God from the center of the life of our society. Even here in Africa, it is becoming so clear. Again, I get amazed at how many educated Africans are moving more and more away from God. But I'll say more about that later. All I want to say that as Paul is in Athens, he's distressed by the idolatry all around. And we, as we follow Christ and observe how our society is moving, we too need to be distressed and be disturbed by these things. Secondly, Paul is displayed before the intellectuals on page 42, line 9 to line 17. Paul displayed before the intellectuals. The Areopagus was the prestigious ancient court that met on Mars Hill, thought to be the most likely group responsible for licensing public lectures. They exercised jurisdiction over religious and educational matters, and so were naturally concerned about Paul's proclamation of Christ and its consequence to undermine the whole system of idolatry until now so dominant in Athens. The invitation to the Areopagus to face a mixed reception seeking clarity about the proclamation of the gospel by Paul is very similar to the pressures we are likely to face in the contemporary world as we proclaim Christ. Paul later writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 9, For it seems to me that God has put apostles on display at the end of the procession, like those condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a, pub, a, a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as human beings. So as Paul comes into this Areopagus to be questioned about this new teaching he's bringing, Paul feels like he has been set to be displayed as if in the arena. I had a bit of an experience of understanding what the arena is like, visiting Carthage twice over the last two years, right in Tunisia. You are taken to some of these old ruins within Carthage, and within those ruins there is at an arena where Christians long time ago were led to face the beasts and face their martyrdom. In 2002, around thereabouts, the governor that governed in that part of the world, it was still a Roman Empire, 
issued a decree that no one was allowed to convert from any other faith to Christianity or to Judaism. But there were two young ladies, amongst many others, who were converted. One of them was called Perpetua, who was born in a very noble background from a rich family. And she had a small little baby. And she was asked to recant her faith by her father when she converted to Christianity. But she refused. Alongside her was another young slave girl called Felicity, who was still pregnant. And as they were told to recant their faith, they refused. And so in AD 203, they were led into this arena where they were held for a while. And then the prison doors would be opened and they come into this small space where animals were released, beasts that were hungry to eat up these Christians. And these arenas had a stand like a football stadium where spectators came and watched as these Christians were torn apart by animals. But these little young ladies refused to give up their faith. In fact, tradition says that when the animals were released on them, the animals came and did not agree or accept to eat them. And it is the gladiators who came with their swords and put their sword into these girls as they, they refused to recant their faith and faced martyrdom. It is a very emotional place as a group of us were praying there last year. We could sense the presence of God, of Christians who are willing to stand for their faith as their lives were put on display. And this is the picture Paul has as he comes to Athens. There are cultural, religious, philosophical, and intellectual barriers people erect as the gospel is preached, not to mention the spiritual opposition from the kingdom of darkness as Christ is proclaimed. The backdrop of Paul's Mass Hill sermon was that he had found himself at the very center of beliefs and practice that were antithetical to the biblical teachings. This young Christian movement was to be tested by the finest thinkers of their times. When you get distressed by modern idols, brothers and sisters, you too will be displayed and you will find yourself facing open ridicule by family, friends, and others who see you as an inconvenience to their selfish pursuits. Caution, we should not be driven by our own insecurities as we face these battles, oppositions, and challenges. Rather, with a spirit-enabled love to face these people, just like Perpetua and Felicity. They had love as they faced those who are about to kill them. I have found in my experience spending a lot more time in the West today where some of these ideas are prevalent, that people are very friendly with you in this kind of postmodern culture. And even when you share the gospel with them, they are quite happy and they are so impressed that you are so confident about what you believe. As long as you do not insist that it applies to them. That is when the problem starts. But we have to be persistent with love and with grace. One of my friends who is a secular humanist and would come to see me often when I was pastor in the church, he would spend, I used to wonder why he comes and sometimes spends three hours. We would have long arguments. Sometimes I would even be getting angry in some of those discussions. But one of the things I discovered, I asked him, have you ever read the Bible? You know, he was so opposed to the Bible all the time. And he told me he hasn't. And that was my weapon. I told him to shut up and go and read the Bible first. <laughs> you know, we had become good friends. We could have quite some robust discussions. But then there were moments in our meetings when he would talk about some, you know, he had health concerns. And he began to talk about his anxiety. I would begin to open up to him. You know, there is hope beyond this world. And I could see the penny drop. But the hardness of the heart was there. So much so that he had ensured in his will, he has written that when he dies, he wants to make sure his body is not taken anywhere near church. Because he told me he doesn't want to be hypocritical. He's a secular humanist, he doesn't believe in God, and he doesn't want anyone after he dies to think that they should be praying to God. But I'm still praying with him, I'm still walk, talking with him. What I notice that a lot of these people have insecurities. And by the way, secular humanists have some very good ideas. They believe in compassion. 
They believe in equality. They are against discrimination. But you know, some of those good ideas are biblical, but it is so confused because the main problem is that they do, not, they do not want God to be the Lord. They want them as the human beings to be the God. It is about rebelliousness of who is in charge. And Paul finds himself before the Areopagus. The third section, as we find in this passage, Paul declared the infallible word. Page 42, line 16, 17, sorry, to page 43, line 12. And if you have your Bible, it's in Acts chapter 17, 22 to 31. Paul declared the infallible word. And I want us to just learn something from Paul's approach as he approaches this very uh, pagan culture in Athens as he preaches the word. Notice that in the book of Acts, when Paul went into the synagogues to preach the gospel, he often started by taking them back to the Old Testament scriptures because that was the tradition where they were brought up in. But when it comes to this pagan culture who have no understanding of the scriptures, he starts from the creator God. So we need to understand the entry point as we meet different groups of people. Today when you go to evangelize and share the gospel, do not assume people know the Bible. Biblical ignorance is rampant today. And especially for those who have grown up in cities, even the, the large cities of Lusaka and Nairobi and Harare and Haveron in, in Botswana, these cities have people who have never been to church. They may be religious, but they do not know what the word of God says. So it is important that we find, first of all, in our approach like Paul, establish a common ground. That's what Paul does in line 17 and 18. Paul establishes a common ground. First of all, he observes that the Athenians were extremely religious. So he affirms them. I can see that you are extremely religious. And of course, immediately they must be feeling good that this person notices that we are actually religious. But however, note, Paul restrains his emotions about the distress he endured because of the idol worship. He does not start by condemning them. He affirms their religiosity. And he begins by asking them, uh, 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 sorry, he, he, he begins by, by talking about the creator God in uh, line 17. I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. Let me just put a point here. You know, when we go to do evangelism, one of the things that I'm discovering more and more, the best way to do evangelism is to ask questions. You know, we often go with a, a package message and we are just waiting for the opportunity to release our missiles. <laughs> but let me tell you, in the contemporary world we live in, the best way to establish a common ground, ask questions. As we ask and pray, and pray that God will help you grow in your understanding of how to ask questions. One of the most excellent books I've read about someone who knows how to ask questions is Out of the Soul Shaker and Into the World by Rebecca Manley Pipet. I've heard Rebecca speak a few times, and she has an amazing gift. She's a trained communication person. But Rebecca has an amazing gift of asking questions. You know there are some people who know how to ask questions. And if you learn how to ask questions well, you don't ask questions like, do you want to live or die? <laughs> Those are not good questions because they do not invite discussion. You need to ask questions that invite discussion. Many of our African friends are becoming agnostics. Now we need to learn that agnostics are people who are not sure God exists. You know, it is the state before atheism. Atheists believe that God does not exist. But that's a big debate because, like my friend, I used to wonder. I told him, in fact, that for you to be an atheist, I, I assured him that he had more faith than me. To believe that God does not exist requires a lot of faith. <laughs> so I used to call him a man of faith. 
But a lot of our contemporary people have not reached that stage where they are denying God. It's not, it's just that because of their much learning, they are not sure that God exists. And those kind of people are called agnostics. And those are the kind of people Paul finds in Athens. And so we find that Paul observes that they had an altar to an unknown God. Possibly in order not to offend any God they may have not recognized. You know, it's a bit like protocol in our modern world. There are people, if you do not introduce them, they'll walk out of the meeting. So these Athenians understood that principle, that in case there is a God they have forgotten, let us make, let's make this altar and say this is to their known God. So that they are, if they are challenged, they see that actually this is the altar. It's only that we didn't know you, but this is the altar. <laughs> when reaching people with the gospel of Christ, however, however intellectual, affluent, or powerful they may appear to be, don't be intimidated. You have something they don't have because you have Christ. We are not going out there to have an argument of, about who is more clever. We are going to introduce them to the life-giving Savior who himself has given them bread. If the Lord just withdrew bread from those kind of people, they will just collapse immediately. And this is the God we are going to introduce to them. Secondly, apart from establishing the common ground, we find that Paul explains Christ's supremacy and human sinfulness. Line 21. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands. We must be careful as we invest in our church buildings today not to limit our understanding of God that he lives in that house. Think of the vibrant house churches in many creative access nations today. You know, I've been to countries where they don't have big church buildings because there's a lot of persecution. So they meet in homes. But God is present and vibrant as these groups meet in homes. Think about some of our brothers and sisters in, even within EPSA who are part of the student movement in one country, I'm not mentioning for the sake of their security. They meet underground. I met one of the believers and they told me for the last 10 years, they have not been able to sing in their meetings. And I was thinking, how many of us would, would continue to stand in Christ if you are not allowed to sing? <laughs> but they are vibrant with the presence of God. Because of persecution, they meet secretly and quietly. God does not live in buildings made by human hands. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. We must guard against the danger of over-glorifying tithes and offerings as the standard of godliness and spirituality. Yes, we give as part of our obedient worship to Father God's witness on earth. But God himself does not need anything from us. When we give, we are not doing God a favor, but rather demonstrating our willingness to depend on him. You know, that's why God has instituted giving. Because when you have money, that's how you live. But when you're giving some of it away, it's an act of faith, trusting that my life depends on God. The principle of giving. There's a lot of abuse. I think that is the most popular sermon probably preach 52 times in most congregations every year. But we need to understand that nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. Therefore, you owe your very existence to God. Some people, including intellectuals, like the ones we find in Athens, take this for granted and then spend their time Challenging the existence of God. This is worth making a film, surely. People who are challenging God, not, and God is the one giving them bread. This is a comedy, or is it a tra tragedy? <laughs> From one ancestor, he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted times for their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live. We are on page 43, line 1, for those who are following. No nation, 
ethnic group is superior than the other. God also raises kings and rulers and brings them down at his appointed time according to his purpose. This point that Paul is making is challenging the Epicurean, Epicurean Curians who didn't believe that God was involved in the affairs of human beings. So he's challenging them. It is also challenging the racism of the Greeks who called those who didn't speak Greek barbarians. At the heart of racism and ethnocentricity and arrogance of rulers of nations is a sinful pride. That's what it is. And Paul is challenging these Athenians that from one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth and he allotted them times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they should live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him though he is not far from each one of us. This is not to mean that people can find God through their natural abilities because for anyone to come to God, the Holy Spirit has to illuminate their dark hearts and bring conviction concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. What I believe Paul is saying here in Athens is that despite human beings having been given a chance to experience God's grace and favors, they have not come back to him in response to acknowledge what he has done. That's what Paul is saying. Remember that creation itself reveals God's eternal power and divine nature, which is evident in all, according to Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. Since we are created by God, it is absurd to imagine that we can worship idols. So what Paul is doing, he has entered the very center of idol worship and he's challenging them. It's like going to the center where they're doing uh, gambling and you begin to challenge them about that kind of gambling. I'm sure it is not the most popular sermon you can give. But then thirdly, apart from establishing the common ground and explaining the supremacy and human sinfulness, he encourages people to repent and trust in Christ. Page 43, line 8 onwards. Paul's apologetic sermon, you know what Paul is doing here is apologetics. He's giving a reasoned defense about the Christian faith that he has in Christ. Paul's apologetic sermon on Mars Hill was to introduce his audience to Christ, but that was not complete without giving them an opportunity to repent. Our call is to be faithful, and Paul's faithful procl proclamation leads to some believing and others sneering. Let me make some applications. As concerns engaging intellectuals today, and that's where we mostly find ourselves as university students and graduates, there are numerous opportunities for us to share our faith even amongst intellectuals who don't seem to be interested. What we should be thinking about is how we can go to their strongholds and bring the light of Christ among them. There are some of us who feel very intimidated by our lecturers. It is always amazing how some lecturers who have things against Christianity, they spend about 10, 15 minutes talking about it in, chair, in class, challenging it. And it can be intimidating. But do not be intimidated. And don't be rude. Be humble. But challenge them. Maybe take, talk to them after class. It may cause you to be identified as a troublemaker. You may even lose some marks because of that. But as children of God, let's pray about it and pray that God will give us wisdom. We had two of those kind of lecturers in the engineering faculty when I was studying. One of them was so arrogant. And I remember he met us once, a group of us coming from, we had gone to do hospital visit and share and pray with patients. And when he came back, he was telling us, now what are you doing? We, we met on the campus and he said, why are you wasting your time doing silly things like that? We didn't respond. But you know, that lecture I did not live long. <laughs> Another one was very troublesome, and we, were re we really suffered. And again, it was so tempting to pray some negative things. But we restrained ourselves by the grace of God. But God gave one of the brothers wisdom. 
We pray that the Lord may promote that lecture and move him to another campus. And the Lord answered our prayer. And that is how life became bearable. But as we share our faith amongst these people, all I'm saying, do not be intimidated. There are many opportunities for us today. And some of the strategic opportunities, as we want to do apologetic sharing of our faith, and it doesn't have to be preaching. It can be a dialogue. It can be a discussion. One of them is international students. International students tend to be more open to the Christian faith, especially when they are coming from countries where they don't have easy access. Do you know I was surprised to discover, visiting one of the islands in the in, in, in Indian Ocean, the island of Comoros, I found that Comorians come to Kenya to learn English in large numbers. I, did, I never knew. And they were telling me how they come and spend all their time in Isili. Comoros is a, is a Muslim island. What an opportunity for us to find Comorians in Kenya and share the gospel of Christ. Because they cannot find Christ unless someone goes to them. Some of them come to Kenya and they were telling horror stories of how they were mugged. And I was very sad, but I understood that sounded like Kenya to me. <laughs> but let us use these opportunities and find international students, whether they are in our country or whether you go to another country, that you may be a witness for Christ, bringing out the Christian faith among those who may not know him. Also, consider further studies in countries that are closed or creative access, countries where there are many or large groups of non-Christians and those from other faiths, that we may go to them and share our faith with them. Consider working with refugees and those from other faiths. Again, a large opportunity that we, we just dismiss. Kenya has had the privilege of hosting refugees for many years. And it has, maybe we have never realized that that has been God's plan, that they may come to know him. And all we do is dislike them. So much, so much, that we have even given them an ultimatum to leave. Showing compassion to the homeless is part of the Christian gospel. And the church and believers should be in the forefront of that. If you have not thought about what you are doing after campus, consider finding work in the refugee camps in your country. It is a strategic place to love them, to care for them, and when opportunities arise, to share the living, loving life of our Lord Jesus Christ with them. The other area that we can engage in is Christian apologetics, as Paul is doing here in Athens. It is especially good when you do it amongst those from other faiths. It is also good, those of you who are spending those six and a half hours on internet, Facebook, move away from telling people, I am bored. You post, I am bored. So what? <laughs> I just ate potatoes. <laughs> that is abusing people's time. Use those forums with wisdom and creativity to post something that is life-giving. Two years ago, I met a Chinese girl in London. And she told me she came from northern China where she had never even heard that Jesus exists. She came to be a student in, in the UK uh, where she studied. And after she finished, she, said, she told me that when she was a student, some Christian students had talked to her, but it never made sense. Eight years later, when she was working as an investment banker in London, she was successful in her late 20s, earning a lot of money, but one day she was out in her room feeling empty and hopeless, suicidal, everything she had. And she went on Facebook and one of her friends had posted the words of a Christian hymn. And she read that hymn and she says that her tears started flowing. And she sent a message to the friend to ask, you know, where, where did you get these words? And the friend said that, in fact, you could come to church. And she said, me? Why? I'm not even a Christian. The friend said, it doesn't matter, you are welcome. And that, when she went to church that Sunday, she says that the person speaking was speaking to her. 
She gave her life to Christ. So, and she became changed. Two years down the line, she resigned her job as an investment banker. And as I speak, she's training in Christian ministry because she says she wants to take the gospel back to her people in China, people who do not know Christ. Now, if you had posted, I am bored, that kind of message does not edify anyone. No one is going to get eternal life because they have read your board. Let's stop these kind of childish things and let us use the internet for something that can glorify God. The other area that we can get involved in is tent making and business as mission. Entrepreneurs are welcome in most countries. Those of you who have a gift, you know, there are very few entrepreneurs in the world. And many of them land on it by accident. You know, Bill Gates did not even complete university. But he had such a sharp mind. So that when they started the computing uh, business with someone else, you can see his shrewdness. From the beginning, I don't know how he convinced the guy who even had the idea that him, Bill Gates, will be taking two-thirds of the profit and the friend a third from the beginning. That was the agreement. <laughs> then you look at today. He's one of the richest persons in the world. Now, I believe that there are some people the Lord has gifted with entrepreneurial gifts here who have a gift and ability to start businesses, to create wealth, and to create employment. Use those gifts for God's kingdom. And use it to employ others. And that's what we call business as mission. You can go to some of these creative, country, creative access countries where there's restrictions, establish a business, employ the local people. And in your business, you know, when you go to a Muslim country, a Muslim country is religious. They expect you to believe in something. So if you believe in God and in Christ, that's good. In your business, what you need to do is that every morning you start with devotions. You read a scripture, and you, of course you have employed the local Muslims. You read a scripture, pray with them, and then you treat them fairly. Pay them well, and also engage with them. Let them work. And through your business, as they see your life, as you read the scriptures, some of them will believe. And, and what you're doing, you are helping to create wealth in the local area. You are creating employment, but you are also bringing life-giving words of Jesus. Those of you who may not have entrepreneurial gifts, you can work as professionals in a company, as doctors, as nurses. You can work in the diplomatic circles. I'm glad Peterson mentioned yesterday. A few years back, I was invited to speak at the Kenyan Embassy in London. It was a meeting that they had leading up to the election. So, of course, they were beginning to, to farm up, and I could see there are lots of camps. But I was surprised to discover that out of the 24 staff in the embassy in London, 20 were Christians. May God lead some of you into the public service in your countries, into the foreign affairs departments, and let your government send you to be a witness for Christ wherever they post you. Pray and aspire that God will lead you into those places. Teaching English, sports trainer, the arts, the arts is totally untapped. And I'm sure that in the next commission, uh, we shall have a plenary session about the arts. It's an amazing place. I met a pastor from the city, I think it's the city of Gothenburg in Sweden. He's an artist and he's a pastor, he's a musician. He's telling the story how using arts has been so powerful in his church. Between two, two, 2010 and two, 2015, they baptized 500 Muslims in his church. The church moved to have 1,500 people. Their services, I think nowadays, they run them in seven different languages. But he told me that they had no plan to reach Muslims. God just worked out things. So sometimes these strategic plan ideas, I, I, I understand them, but God works outside them as well. We need to be people who listen to the voice of God and hold our plans lightly. We need them, but hold them lightly because the Spirit of God sometimes works faster than those plans. Let me conclude by saying, as students and graduates who often are part of the social groups of intellectuals and educated people in our countries, we should expect that we shall be tested in the secular world. Our challenge is to use the opportunities we get to share the gospel of Christ. And if you do not get opportunities, create them. Although we should attempt to share the gospel in a way 
that is contextually relevant, intelligible, and fresh, we must not compromise the message. Our knowledge or persuasive abilities will not save people, but rather it is the power of the gospel itself that will save. The gospel can be shared by a sister who has such the most gentle voice. But let me tell you, it is the gospel it has power to save even the most strong man. We will need to understand the prevailing worldviews, the questions and doubts people have, and the idols that take people's attention off the living God. But pray that God will give you wisdom at every stage. Secondly, prepare yourself for service. If you want to be a missionary, take time to prepare. Don't just rush out. Go to Bible school. Learn. Learn about mission. Learn about cultures. Talk to missionaries. Do a short-term trip to look at a different country and how they work. Read widely about mission and other cultures. Know what you believe and know what others believe. Cultivate a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit's leading and be willing to share the gospel and remain humble and faithful. Humility is required. Have faith that God will work through you. You know, one of the things that amazes me as I visit a lot of our missionaries, you know, a lot of missionaries are extremely ordinary people. In fact, there's nothing that stands out about them. But God has given them grace to live incarnational lives in a different community and be the presence of God's word. And often, they don't see much fruit. But maybe one local person comes to Christ, and when the missionaries leave, that local person becomes the one who brings change and transformation. God has his ways of working. And then finally, let us move away from individual-centered ministry mentalities to learn to collaborate together, work in partnership, as Peterson pointed out last night. Look at even church growth statistics today in major cities. A lot of the salvations, are, uh, the church growths are happening by church transfer. Somebody plants a new church and then everybody moves from the old one to the new one. That is called fishing from the net. God sent us to fish, not from the net, but from the sea. Let us call those who do not know Christ. When people who are born again are moving to your church, tell them to go back to their church and look for people who do not know Jesus. Our aim is to extend God's kingdom and not to try to outdo each other. We must guard against the vicious competition to outdo each other and allow with humility and grace the Spirit of God to bring those who do not know Christ to know him, whether they are intellectual or people of low abilities. And by God's help, we will succeed. Let's pray. Father, we pray that out of what I've shared this morning, you will take those words Apply them to our hearts by your Holy Spirit so that each one of us can respond in the way that you want us to respond. We are all different. We are all individual. We may not even know and not even mention the things that you are calling some people here to do, but we pray that your Spirit will lead them and that they will have the courage to be able to step up in faith. And Lord, you will bless their efforts. We pray this in Jesus' name.